Hello, everyone. I have to adjust. How's that? I can't. Oh, there we go. Wow. How's everyone doing this evening? Um, he stole all my introductory material, actually. I was going to tell you about my science interest and all of that. I don't like that. Okay, that's better. Um, as he mentioned, this, uh, this topic is particularly dear to me for many, many reasons. And this being the first time I've actually spoken about it specifically, I have to admit I'm a little nervous. Anyone who knows me knows I have a bit of a crush on this guy, if you will. Certainly an intellectual obsession. As uh, David pointed out, once I had been teaching many, many different authors in religion and science and exploring the relationship, what these mean to us, things like that. And then I found this book, and it changed everything in terms of my understanding, not just of what I was trying to understand in terms of the relation between religion and science, but what I was trying to understand about why everything seems so fucked up now. And hopefully, my goal here tonight uh, is to introduce you to this 800-page, 20 years in the making book, uh, at least enough so you will have a rough idea of what this guy's talking about, and if I pull it off correctly, you will be intrigued and research further. I can only get people who take my classes to read this book, it seems, but maybe some of you will be bold and go for it anyway. But good news for all of us and the world at large if you buy into to what he and I are saying here, uh, there's a movie coming, a documentary of the master and his emissary. It seems a silly thing, but it, hopefully, fingers crossed, it will be a good movie. So the easiest way to do this, like I said, this is a big book that covers a lot of ground. Has anyone here read it? Who's familiar with him, at least? The, uh, to the three people I made, oh, and two others. <laughs> people I've made read it otherwise. Who's, has anyone else heard of him before tonight? OK, great. So he is an English oof, polymath, renaissance man. Now we say hyphenated person. We'll get to why that's problematic. And renaissance is a better choice. Uh, he started out as a don of, uh, he read poetry at Oxford, wrote a pretty famous book on poetry, and then decided to become a doctor, and then studied philosophy, and then wrote this book, which has become his, his life's mission. The, just briefly, the book itself, the first half of the book is pretty extensive neuroscience. I don't know that I'll get into a lot of that, but basically what he's done in this book is spend the first half of the book supporting his argument in terms of the kind of scientific evidence that what he's saying about the difference between the right and left hemisphere is valid and well supported by research. The second half of the book is a history of Western civilization from about 600 BC to the present, showing throughout that time period swings, transitions, if you will, between, well, well this will all make more sense as we get going, but between right hemisphere and left hemisphere dominance, basically. Between the left hemisphere and what it brings to the table seeming to run society, and between a more balanced vision where the right and left hemisphere are both involved. He's going to explain all this here. So I found, in general, the easiest thing for me to do is show you this 10-minute video, uh, which he did with the RSA. Um, the RSA is like a good version of TED. Sorry if you're a TED <laughs> fan. I have a lot of problems with TED. And I don't know. I even like to think if they asked me, I'd say no. Uh, but McGilchrist has done it as well. Uh, I can't resist. I told myself I wouldn't do this, but it, just to give you a hint of why I find Ted so problematic is Ted only has kind of one mode, and it's never really in depth, but it, the, you usually have something funner to play with, but this is how Ted works, right? Today, I am going to show you the most earth-shattering thing that humanity has come up with. You may not think so, but this is going to change everything about what you thought about the world. Did you know we can put books on paper now? <laughs> anyway, so the RSA is a little more in depth. They're two to four hour lectures. This is a 10 minute version with these lovely animations. Strongly recommend if you appreciate this at all. Obviously, you're all curious about learning. They're all on the web and they're all amazing. The Barbara Ehrenreich one about, uh, called Smile or Die about the problem with positive thinking is particularly delicious. So I'm going to start this up. 
and then we'll dive in. Uh, I love going for questions, but we'll dive in, see how much of this makes sense, and I'll help us all work through it. I have that poster. <laughs> In case you're wondering how committed I am to all this. So lots of information, I know. My thought is to try and help us kind of get through some of it. Um, uh, even just watching it, I don't always know where to start. But the first thing, well, does anyone have any questions off the bat? Never quite that lucky. All right, so. Um, why does this matter, right? I think that's kind of the first most important question as far as I'm concerned. As I mentioned, I think mostly we all seem to agree things aren't going great for humanity. I don't know. Maybe you are all doing lovely and think 67,000 homeless people is a reasonable number. Um, but it seems we've, we've lost a lot of our humanity. Uh, in, in, I don't know, I would argue the last 2,000 years, as he would, but certainly since uh, the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution, we are on a particular path. Um, many people think it's a great path. Many people think it's the path that will save humanity. Uh, Mr. McGilchrist and I think it's deadly, uh, that we're in fact sacrificing what it is that makes us human in order to create a world as envisioned, if you will, by the left hemisphere, as envisioned by the Enlightenment, and as built by the Industrial Revolution. When you walk out of here, actually even here, it's tough to find anything that's actually appealing to the right hemisphere. Everything here is constructed. One thing I always like to point out, there are no straight lines in nature. There absolutely are no straight lines in nature, and that's a fascinating thing. If you think about it, the majority of us spend our entire lives seeing nothing but straight lines, except for the odd human face, which we don't seem to pay as much attention to as we once did. One of the things that struck me, I always, this is a point that I always go back to, does anyone know roughly what they say, what percent of communication is body language? What do that? That's a high one, what else? Are you gonna say Thomas? I was gonna say 80. Yeah, I've heard, you know, I hear 70 to 90. Let's even go with 70 and be generous. So that means a lot of you, and a large portion of Western civilization, is willing to communicate with people that are their, quote, friends, at only 30% of their ability. Right? So basically, you're willing to communicate at the level of what? A four-year-old? in terms of actually being able to communicate meaningful things between people, because once the body language is gone, that's what we're down to. Maybe even 10% if your number's right. So part of that is, again, this is, we are, uh, why is this related to left and right hemisphere? Because the left hemisphere is the one that's insist, if you will, the left hemisphere is insisting that this new thing called the internet and email and Twitter and all this is actually making us all closer to each other. Yes, thank you, I agree, snort, right? It is obscene what it's doing to us. It is actually making us further apart. It is destroying empathy. It is, empathy has to happen in person. This notion that now that we know there are starving babies in Africa, by the way, wasn't that what everyone kept saying to us in the 60s and 70s before the internet, right? All this stuff about now we know everything about the rest of the world. I'm not convinced we didn't know most of this before. But we, and we did, in that we knew it implicitly. We knew the way the right hemisphere knows that the world is full of suffering and injustice. Right? We just know that, don't we? Don't you know that? Do you think we can really get out of that? You really think there's a way to get to a place where everything is peaceful and pleasant for everyone all the time? Make the whole world a safe space? Does anyone who knows me want to tell us what I think the only safe space is? The grave. The grave. <laughs> the grave is the only safe space. The point of life isn't to be safe, it's to be engaged. To live as fully as possible, not to be as protected as possible. And that's a lot of what the left hemisphere, certainly at this point, when I hear political debates and all of that, <clears throat> the left hemisphere is very much about control and power, right? Let me just pause and say, you know, as he points out, and I want to be clear about this, I'm not saying we should all get left hemispherectomies. We need our left hemisphere. We need our right hemisphere. We need both. There's a reason we have both. Whatever you're into, God, Darwin, whoever made us this way, there is a reason that this has happened. And one of the interesting things to me is that for the last poof, 80 years, until the last 20 years or so, 
we always referred to it as either the lesser or, oh, I'm blanking on the word, but basically it was always referred to as a hemisphere that was unnecessary. It was kind of the brain equivalent of humans still having tails. We didn't really need it, it was left over from something. All of the evidence in this book and from all the neuroscientists these days is showing actually it's quite vital to making us human beings. So the argument isn't stop left hemisphere, we need that. We need control sometimes, but not over everything and not all the time. We need to grasp and manipulate things in the world. But when grasping and manipulating becomes our primary way of interacting with each other, we're running into territory where the left hemisphere is dominating. Where the hemisphere, the part of our mind that tells us about compassion, that tells us about the erasme and the, the um, I just said the word, empathy, the aspect of being connected to each other as individuals, not as categories, right? The categorization all happens in the left hemisphere, right? So what happens is the world comes into us. From, first of all, almost everything is wired straight to the right hemisphere. I know you didn't want neuroscience, I'll keep it small. But the basic line is ev all of our senses, all of our experience of the world first goes to the right hemisphere, where it just kind of is. It just kind of exists there. And here's the intriguing part of, of the neuroscience to me. The left hemisphere can't say, hey, right hemisphere, what's new in the world? Because remember, the right hemisphere is always vigilant for, ooh, always vigilant for what's new, for what it hasn't experienced, where the left hemisphere is primarily concerned with what's familiar, what is already known. So for anything new to come into our minds, it has to come through the right hemisphere. Here's where it gets a little weird. It comes in, all of it. Constantly, we're taking in the world, all day, all night, all the time. And then the left hemisphere gets to make a choice. This is how the corpus callosum works. There are other ways for information to transfer, but the primary way that information goes between the hemispheres is the corpus callosum. And that only works basically in one direction. Right? The, the left hemisphere can't say, hey, what's going on, right hemisphere? All it can say is, as it's described in the literature, no or not no. So it can say, no right hemisphere, I'm busy making computers and humans into robots. And the right hemisphere will be, but wait, that's fucked up. And it'll be, whatever, I, talk to the hand, right? Or it can say, hey, right hemisphere, anything new I should know about? But it doesn't do that because it doesn't want to know the new. Many of us don't want to know the things that we don't want to deal with, the things that we don't, how many, I could say over and over, 67,000 homeless people. I think about that every day. I don't know why, maybe because I'm a poor teacher, I know it could be me, but whatever. The point is, that is a terrifying thought. And we, I, I can only stay sane because I push that thought away a lot. The idea that we will allow 67,000 of our fellow city dwellers to live on the street that we think that's okay, that we're not freaking out about that, to me is a clear sign that the right hemisphere is not being listened to. We can bring this into almost any socio-political whatever argument you wanna talk about, and we will find the problem is an obsessive left hemisphere understanding of the issue. People are shooting people in schools, we need to get rid of guns and fix the broken people. That's very left hemisphere. The right hemisphere might suggest that something might just be off altogether. Maybe our entire culture is in trouble if this is happening, not just there's too many guns. We have our first female, there's gender equity for you, right? Hey, from a statistical standpoint, that's good news, right? It's not just a young male thing, now we're actually seeing our whole society's angry and frustrated. But all of that just comes back as a left hemisphere problem. What rules do we need to impart? What laws do we have to enact? How do we control this? There's, I don't know if any of you saw this backlash, because a lot of people, uh, I can't remember who can keep track of which shooting, but one of the shootings, um, I think it was the Florida one, uh, a lot of people were posting maybe if somebody had reached out to this kid. The backlash was fierce, fierce. You really, everyone, you should go look. Everyone's saying back to the few people who are saying maybe some compassion would have helped, and immediately people, you don't know what you're talking about, we can't do that, this kid's crazy, how can we even think being nice to some lunatic will help? It's one of our fellow human beings, right? So what we can do, thanks to the left hemisphere, is separate him out, right? That kid who killed all the kids in Florida, the woman at YouTube, she's not like us, she's not one of us. She's something broken, she's something different than us. 
That is a left hemisphere thought. In the right hemisphere, so again, you know, if we look at these, I don't want to over-anthropomorphize or be reductionistic, for sure, but we can talk about them a little bit in terms of personalities. And the right hemisphere, as he describes, has a certain attitude towards the world, which is basically one of care and concern. The left hemisphere's attitude towards the, one is, towards the world is one of power and control, right? And again, we need both. The thing that really shifted my understanding of this and everything was finally buying into the quote I know some of you are sick of me hearing from Heraclitus, which is, war is the father of all things. When I first heard that quote, it was very hard for me to get, I, I got to it at a good time so I could soften a little, but my first reaction was the same knee-jerk hippie reaction that I had ingrained in me is, no, war is bad, always. We must stop war, there can never be any more war. I think a lot of you think that, that seems like a nice thought. Is it realistic though? That becomes the question. And more importantly, when Heraclitus says war is the father of all things, he's not saying we have to have big wars against nations or else nothing happens. He was saying that conflict is in fact the father of all things. I always have to say that because nobody likes hearing war. But conflict is the father of all things. The brain arguably is the most powerful opponent processors in the world. Opponent processing plays off this Heraclitus idea, which is that everything that exists, all that is created in the world, is created out of opposition. The simplest way to think about this, I mean, you can go on about some kind of philosophical night and day, wet and dry, all of these things, right? If we didn't have both, we wouldn't have anything. If we didn't have night and day, we wouldn't have plants and we wouldn't have life. We need both, even though many of us, since the Industrial Revolution, don't ever get night, right? There's always some light. We never get proper darkness. We know that this is really bad for us, making it hard for us to sleep, blah, blah, blah. Again, an artificial construction, the idea that we should decide when the lights are on. How many of you would love it if your whole life was when it gets dark, you get ready for bed and go to sleep? When the sun comes up, you get ready for work, right? None of these time changes, none of these I got to stay up for four hours and answer emails in the dark. Right? We would actually allow ourselves to experience the cycle of night and day once again. Everything is based on these opponent processes. And the one that I've been thinking about a lot lately is muscles. Our entire body is based on a system of opponent processors, including our brain, obviously. What do I mean? The only reason I can do this is because I both have a bicep and a tricep. If these are not both there, what happens if I lose my tricep? Oh, forever. Right? I'll never be able to stretch my arm back out again. Unless I get assistance, right? I guess I'll get my left hemisphere to help. I'll get a robot that pushes my, I don't know. But do you understand what I mean by opponent processors, right? This is so, this is really important because that's the thing we want to understand here. Not that it is a problem per se that we have these two halves of our brain, but in fact that it's the only reason we're alive. It's the only reason we can engage the world in a creative manner and that the conflict between these two views is what allows us to, and I don't even like this term much, progress as human beings. We like to talk about progress. Uh, who wants this? Sam, which one of these guys, that book? Uh, Hitchens? No. The new one. Pinker, Stephen Pinker's new book, which, in which he proclaims quite proudly that this is the most peaceful and wonderful time ever in human history. Help me, I, I don't understand, and you read this book. One of my favorite takedowns of Pinker and his ilk is a guy called Berlinski, a mathematician. And because uh, it, it's an amazing book, I can't remember what it's called, but um, the, Pinker likes to do these things, these like uh, lists, like his book has 80 something charts in it, his new book. It's all left hemisphere in praise of the left hemisphere, right? Everything is better about humans. And so Berlinski does a great thing. And he's like, let's just do a little history of humanity's beautiful last two centuries. And it's just a litany of wars, right? And again, I just said war is the father of all things. But Jesus, no wonder we're overpopulated then. That almost worked. I liked that joke in my head better than it came out. <laughs> anyway, um, the, the issue being here kind of how, and, and what McGilchrist's doing and what I'm here to try and help you guys at least think about is switching away from this 
obsessive belief that we are here at the pinnacle of human progress right now. I don't see the evidence for it. One of my favorite things, I love when people call, pull out the we're living longer than ever thing. Do you understand how ridiculous this is? Has anyone ever seen pictures from like the 19th century of Native Americans before they killed them all? Like the, the Indian chief who looks like he's 120? Because he is, not because they didn't have moisturizer. <laughs> who is, I always get, I get all the ancient Greeks mixed up. I think uh, Thales was probably at least 80 something when he died. We're talking 400 BC. 80 is older than the lifespan in the United States, which is now not even the highest in the West, right? So something's wrong. I don't buy the idea we're making progress, that there's more peace and more freedom and all of that. One way you have to buy into me arguing that is to have a slightly longer view historically than the left hemisphere wants you to have. Uh, when I think about it, I think, oh, maybe we did really well as hunter-gatherers, whatever, 50, 100,000 years ago. The argument that we have created the best possible civilization the best society, the best situation for being a human being is purely one from the left hemisphere, from the enlightenment, and reinforced by the industrial revolution. The bottom line for me is we can do something about this. The reason that I love McGilchrist so much, as much as I hate the kind of, uh, oh, the argument, you know, when you tell someone why you think something's terrible and they're like, well, you don't have a solution, so shut up. And, yeah, that's not really a great argument. We need to challenge each other. But it is nice when someone does offer a solution. And I'll save it for my last couple of comments, but one of the things is the last chapter of the book is a very powerful argument for the things that can bring us back to the right hemisphere's worldview. The things that will allow us to see some of what the right hemisphere sees and experiences, allow us to re-embrace empathy. You know how powerful the left hemisphere is? There's a whole movement against empathy right now. This is my favorite argument. Well, so, sorry, briefly. There, there are two things, rationality and reason. Right, McGilchrist makes this distinction, I quite love it. The left hemisphere is concerned with rationality. The right hemisphere is concerned with reason. Something can be rational, but not be reasonable. Does that make sense? So for example, I'm gonna skip what I was gonna say because it occurred on the way here that I wanna say this, which is I think you're gonna disagree with this, but maybe we'll get to an agreement. Our current president is extremely rational. He is not reasonable. I know you're not gonna argue with me on that one. Some of you might, but whatever. But he is extremely ultimately rational. And I think the argument that we tend to make that he's just a crazy person or whatever, well, you know who else is super rational? Schizophrenics. And I'm not diagnosing him, that's a stupid, boring game. I'm a therapist, but I'm not gonna try that. Um, do, it, do any of you understand what I mean by that? Yeah, do you have a thought? Right. Right. So he's saying that you know it's about doing something in in. Well, sorry, say that the first point. Do it. As opposed to doing something that may actually be your end. Right. Rationality means something that you perceive. Got it. Something you perceive to be in your interest rather than something it truly is. That's a really interesting point because, again, we look at the left hemisphere and we see it's only interest in what it already knows, right? So, and we know famously Trump doesn't really care what anyone has to say around him. And supposedly, and I don't want to turn this into a Trump thing, it's just this is someone we all know. I could talk about Kim Kardashian, but I don't know as much about her. And I'm pretty sure she's way left hemisphere. Anyone ready to try and guess why? I don't know, isn't she like 50% synthetic at this point? <laughs> I mean, between the makeup and the hair and the butt, I guess that's real. Anyway, um, but it's the same era, right? And so tr Trump's hair, I don't want to turn this into Trump, but it is fun. It is an important thing, to, <laughs> but the hair, 
That, that hair doesn't look natural. I know that sounds silly and petty, but this is how, this is my biggest goal here tonight is to get some of you, all of you if I'm lucky, to notice this stuff in the world, the difference between right hemisphere and left hemisphere experience of the world. So when we're talking about things being perfect, controlled, precise, assertiveness is the biggie. Right? The only emotion that primarily resides in the left hemisphere is anger. That's a very important thing to note. Basically, whenever you see anger, you're seeing the left hemisphere rear its head. And that's awesome, and we need it for that. That's the part of our brain we need when we're angry or scared, because that's the part that does the fight or flight stuff. Right? Whereas the right hemisphere will be like, ooh, tiger. <laughs> nice. <laughs> right? Not a good plan, right? And so we need both. We need part of it. But the problem is we go, oh, tiger, nice. And the left hemisphere is like, no, it's one of those spotted ones. Suddenly we have tiger racism. <laughs> I, I mean, I joke, but it's true, right? Racism is only possible with a dominant left hemisphere. As in, racism is only possible when we prioritize categories over individuals, right? And so one of the things that's very disturbing, don't get scared, David, but like the gender stuff, where instead of trying to move towards a new, more fluid understanding of gender, we tell everyone you got to pick one. Do you understand what I'm saying? I, 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 everyone be what you want, sleep with who you want, I don't care. What scares me is that now we're telling people you have to pick one of these 63 categories of gender. LGBTQRSFNG, right? I mean, look it up on Wikipedia. There's one version that's like 30 things long. Again, I don't care who people are, what they want to be. What I'm concerned about is us having more and more narrower and narrower categories for what it means to be human. The only thing, though, the bright side of all this is if we keep going this direction, there's a possibility we'll go full circle and we'll get back to actually understanding each other as individuals rather than categories. That's my hope, right? Because if we keep, if we add enough letters to whatever, LGBTQ or whatever category, races, if we've got enough races, we end up with 6.3 billion races, right? That's what the right hemisphere sees. Six point, it doesn't see them all. It sees the one it's surrounding and has a kind of vivid awareness of the rest of us out there. But the idea instead that what we do is we make ourselves more precisely categorized rather than more truly ourselves. Right? We still find, and part of the reason this stuff is playing out this way is because we've all been raised in the left hemisphere's world. It's been its world arguably for basically 500 years at this point. And it seems to be getting more extreme. So we keep pushing all of our assumptions is this is good. More categories is fairer, right? We're doing the same thing with the census, right? We added a ton of more race categories. Is it covering it now? No. How many race categories do we need for it to be fair? 350 million, right? But we can't do some of the stuff we need to do as a government and society. We do need to do some averaging. We do need to figure out who needs what and who doesn't. So again, we're not saying we can't do this stuff. We're saying let's be reasonable about it. Let's understand that these are the maps of the world, not the world. Your choice of what you call yourself, be it in terms of gender or race or whatever, is not who you are. The descriptions of yourself on Facebook, a left hemisphere thing if ever there was one, are not who you are. They can never, I don't want to get cheesy, but the fullness of who you are as a human being can never be described in words. And that doesn't mean we should never try and describe things in words. It's that we should always do it fully aware of their limitations. Do you understand what I mean? Right? I don't want to stop using words. Just like he says, I value words. I am obsessed with words. I have a new favorite word. This is so left hemisphere. Apophenia. It's basically a, a fancy college word for uh, people who have conspiracy theories. It's a very left hemisphere thing, right? It's the tendency to perceive connections and meaning between unrelated things. P 
perfect description of the left hemisphere's mode of operation in our world right now. Right? So I value words highly, and if we can be more precise and considerate and flexible about our words, great. But we tend to believe, again, the words, which are a map, are the territory that we can replace reality itself with symbols for reality, representations of reality that, fine, we got to do it. But always we got to do it knowing that's not the real thing. That profile of that person on Facebook you thought was your friend, that's not your friend anyway, so don't be upset that now they're into, I don't know, grunge core. I just made up a genre maybe. Anyway. Whatever it is, has nothing to do with the reality of who that human being is. Our descriptions of the world are not the world. That's the thing. And so one of the things that's really intriguing to me, being so interested in language, is that more and more, we, language becomes explicit, right? There's very little understanding of the kind of flex, and we want to use more and more explicit, precise language all the time. And what dies in the process is one of the most important things our language has, which is metaphor. Right, metaphor is clearly a function of the right hemisphere. If you're wondering how we know all this, it's because we chop up people's brains and electro, like we can do all this stuff where we can shut off one hemisphere or the other now. And so when we turn off the right hemisphere, people don't get jokes. It's fascinating, right? Like one of my favorite examples is like someone will walk into the room and they'll be like, ooh, it's hot in here. And Someone with no active right hemisphere understands that as a weather report, not a request to change the temperature, right? So everything becomes explicit, explicit, precise, and concrete, which is not what the world is. I'll throw out now the other thing I love that Heraclitus said, which is that we never step in the same stream twice. And the important thing about that phrase is twofold. A, I think we can all figure out the stream is constantly changing. I don't know. I don't know how long all you've been in New York. Water runs to, anyway. <laughs> it's like when I try and talk about cars to my Hunter students. Um, the stream is constantly changing, it's flowing, we're all familiar with that concept, but just as important, so are we. So it's not just that we can't step in the same stream twice, but there isn't the same us to take that step twice. And that's something else that we're losing track of. Right? The left hemisphere doesn't buy into it. The left hemisphere doesn't buy into death. It does not, the left hemisphere is the one that's infected Ray Kurzweil with the obsession of uploading us to the internet. Right? Only someone who has very little access to any depth of human experience, certainly the right hemisphere, would believe that a human brain uploaded to the internet will still be a human being as we know them. Right? First of all, there's that body language problem again. We'll just be a bunch of human beings loaded up on the internet, talking to each other at 20% of our potential. That doesn't seem good. And only the left hemisphere could devalue the importance of the body in our experience of being human to that extent. In the left hemisphere, the body becomes a machine, or an assemblage of parts, as he points out. It becomes, <laughs> just kills me. If you follow medicine as obsessively as I do, you, and I do it just to ridicule it, but uh, the, this, this one killed me. First of all, uh, about seven years ago, we discovered a new bone in the knee. How many human beings have we chopped up? We literally discovered a new bone. It's really important bone, actually. It's tiny, but it has a really important, it, uh, one of the leading causes of ACL damage. Some of you probably have statistically. Um, I, I, a French anatomist had pointed it out in the 19th century, but you know, the French, but anyway. <laughs> at least our attitude towards them then. Um, and then, I think a couple years ago, someone found it, it's fascinating. For centuries, we assumed, and I hope you can see how only the left hemisphere could be this narrow-minded. We assumed that the white matter, which is what we've called it, in the brain was basically packing material, right? Like peanuts, I guess, do we still have peanuts? Now we have those uh, inflated things from Amazon. But <laughs> there we go. But, Basically, it was packing material. It had no useful function other than to just hold your brain in place. It doesn't take a, you know, a deep abiding belief in either God or Darwin to think that the human doesn't just create random stuff over evolutionary time frames. Surprise, surprise. Tons of research now being done. It appears that it is one of the most important parts of the brain in terms of information transfer 
All we cared about was the neurons because that's what we saw and knew. Again, left hemisphere. Last week was an even better one. I have a therapy patient who's a doctor and we blew half his session talking about this because it's so amazing. But there is stuff called interstitial tissue throughout the body, which until last week was assumed to be the same as white matter, basically packing material in the body. Does anyone hear this? Do you know what it actually seems to be? Yeah. Vital for a number of things, fluid transfer, but most importantly, it seems to be the main thing that produces lymph in our body. The hell did we not know that? I suggest we cannot know that only because we have become so obsessed with the left hemisphere's approach to science. This is where it all comes together for me because science and religion, as far as I'm concerned, have all but been destroyed by an obsessively left hemisphere approach. Religion, easy, right? I, I, you can probably guess how that got screwed up. Biblical literalism, let's start there. Many people think biblical literalism is an ancient tradition. There was a glimpse of it in the fourth or fifth century and then it went away because even then they were dumb enough to know that's a stupid way to look at the Bible. Dumb enough, smart enough. But they understood this isn't going to get us anywhere. I don't know. I hope you understand that all scripture, all mythologies, all religious teachings are metaphorical in nature. Right? They're trying to express things that normal language can't. That's what metaphor means. Literally, it means to carry over. Metaphors are mechanisms in our language that carry meaning across the chasm that language itself creates. Or as someone once said, uh, I thought quite beautifully, metaphor is the solution to the problem of language. Right? So when we are able to look at the Bible or Quran or any script you want metaphorically, then it comes alive. Then it becomes personal. Then it becomes informative about what it means to be human. When we look at it literally, it becomes an instruction manual. And a really confusing one at that. I've been teaching religion for a long time, and you try and read this stuff literally. I mean, first of all, there's direct contradictions. The same phenomena happens in science. When science loses a sense of being about exploration and curiosity, and instead becomes about power and innovation, right? Innovation is right, is left, so even I get confused sometimes. Innovation is left hemisphere. Creativity is right hemisphere, right? So now, when you go to Silicon Valley, you don't hear a hell of a lot of talk about creativity. You hear a lot of talk about innovation, about creating frictionless apps, something else, again, only the left hemisphere would believe in is a frictionless world, just like safe spaces, right? That's not the world we live in. And so instead, the argument, so generally science becomes obsessed, as you know, science is obsessed not with genuine discovery, but mostly with making money, creating control mechanisms, and strengthening its power base. So again, I love both of them. I want to help them. I want to make religion a useful force for us again, and I want to make science a useful force for us again, rather than purely serving the agenda of the left hemisphere. That's kind of my point, is that as long as everything we do, both as individuals, as societies, and our different aspects of culture, is purely serving the left hemisphere's needs, then we're really kind of burying ourselves in a, in a rationality loop. Where we, the thing, here's the craziest thing for me. I teach this book, so yeah, if I'm talking fast, it's because I usually spend an entire semester on this topic, so. Um, but, Year after year, and it didn't, I've been teaching I think six years, I've read it like seven or eight times, and only in the last year or two have I started getting this incredibly bizarre th response from 20-ish year olds, which is I talk about how eventually if we keep this up, there won't really be any emotions, if we upload ourselves, we won't really be fully human because our body is a major way we experience the world. And these kids all say, whatever, we won't know what we're missing. Yikes, that's such a terrifying thought to me. I keep trying to come up with analogies, like, oh, well, I mean, I guess if everyone just, their arms fall off when they're born and no one has arms, we won't know what we're missing. Even that doesn't work, because that's nowhere near as terrifying to me as the dystopian Wally-esque vision of a bunch of people plugged into machines not experiencing anything other than constant what? Happiness? I don't think so. Contentment, I guess. 
doesn't seem very satisfying. One of the most important things about happiness, I know as a therapist, as he mentions, about the paradox between the different aspects of what it means to be human and how generative and creative those are. Happiness doesn't exist without sadness. It's a very simple formula. There is no being happy all the time, despite what the left hemisphere and the secret and the power of positive thinking and all of those books. Our dear president, by the way, you know that um, Dale Carnegie, I always get confused, because this book, you know, The Secret's been written every decade for the last 60 years. I think it's, is it Dale, one of the early ones, he, along with Roy Cohn, very scary lawyer, he was a regular at the Trump dinner table. So he was raised on this power of positive thinking stuff, which again, I don't know, people are sick of hearing me say this, but I've been saying since before he got elected, he is the president we deserve. And it, it does make, I'm not saying that's good, I'm not saying I'm thrilled about it, but he makes a lot of sense for us, the furthest left hemisphere society in the world, to elect someone who is complete, I don't even know if he has a right hemisphere. And if he does, he hasn't heard from it in a while. <laughs> Just saying, and again, not turning into Trump bashing, just a good example. Think about people you know that are similar. Think about the, and I, this isn't about diagnosing, this is about becoming more aware of the situation. Think about people you know who never get the joke, right? Who always just kind of look at you blankly when you say something funny. It's not because you're not funny. Well, it might be, but if everyone, nobody ever laughs at your joke, then you're the one that needs to talk to your right hemisphere, I guess. <laughs> <But> <laughs> <laughs> One last thought, you know, um, just a thought to give you kind of something to think about, and then I'd love it if you have any questions. We have a few minutes, but um, there's, there's all these word pairs that come up in his book that I really love, and I would love it if we had another hour, because I would spend the next hour going into these. But they offer some real insight, and more importantly to me, with my agenda here tonight, they offer you a way to at least try and apply this understanding as you go through your day, or night, or whatever. Um, for example, generally, so a lot of these came up here. Implicit understanding tends to be a feature of, I could start quizzing you, the right hemisphere. Explicit is left hemisphere. One thing that keeps coming up to me, I hear a lot in political stuff, and you know, again, raised by a hippie, all about freedom and justice. But when I hear over and over all day long about how it's so wonderful that so-and-so has a voice, what's the point of a voice if no one's listening to you? Just saying. I'm not saying we shouldn't all be able to speak and share our experience of the world, but this idea that having a voice is somehow enough, that somehow just having a voice, you know, it seems to me a lot of people have a voice right now in our society, and all we're doing is screaming simultaneously, and none of us are listening to each other, right? So to, to, it, it's one thing to, to speak but it's another thing to be heard. And the other thing I always think about too is, um, uh, I have this obsession with this phrase I, I came up with that is everyone wants to be looked at, but nobody wants to be seen. And that to me is very deeply what the internet is about. Look at me, look at, look at me. But by seen, I mean known as a human being. I want to be looked at and I want you to know, I, you know, it's a Jungian persona is all it is. That's all the internet is, is us putting our Jungian personas online. This is what I want the world to think I am. God forbid they find out what I really am, right? And the more we encourage that behavior, the scarier it becomes for all of us to expose ourselves genuinely in any meaningful way because we get unused to it. It's scary. So let's just be clear. The right hemisphere is scary to us. There is a reason that the word for left in Latin is sinestra sinister, right? Historically, there has been this thing, sorry left-handers, but you'll, you'll see there's an upside. There's been this thing about left-handers being a little dodgy and evil, and also creative, right? We even know statistically there's a few more left-handers uh, percentage-wise in the creative fields than right-hand, than in regular fields. Ugh, math. Anyway, <laughs> but <laughs> the point is, it is. It's profoundly creative, but it's also scary. It took me a while to get this and did a lot of reading and thinking about it. Why scary? Why bad? Why sinister? Because it tells us the stuff we don't want to know about. It breaks down our little cocoons that we hold in our left hemisphere where the world is what we think it should be and things are going the way I want to be and comes out 
of the blue, seemingly, with information to fuck up all our plans. That's what the right hemisphere does, and that's why it's often been viewed as sinister or dangerous. And to the left hemisphere, it's the enemy sometimes. I'm over here in my left hemisphere happily creating an idea of what the world is, and this damn right hemisphere is going to come in and tell me stuff that messes up my model of the world. Right? We have these models, and we like them. And that, you, know, you understand, all of you understand this on some level, whether it's a death or a breakup. Right? Everything's going fine. This is lovely. As far as I can tell, she thinks I'm the best man on earth. Why did she just dump me? Or as far as I can tell, my family is blissful and wonderful. Why did my daughter just die? Because the world does that. And what we do instead is we jump into this idea that we need to stop this. The left hemisphere said, no more death. I'm going to the internet. I'll be there if you need me. The other thing too, the other word pair I really love too is the difference between gaze and stare. The left hemisphere stares. The right hemisphere gazes. I could go on about that one forever. We are mostly a culture that stare at things and get stared at. Do you stare at a loved one? Wow, the hesitation scared me, but okay. How's that going? Uh, the, you know, we gaze at those we love. Gazing is a two-way thing. Staring is an aggressive thing, right? So it's funny, actually, I'm thinking about it. Linguistically, things get complicated, because we talk about the male gaze in feminist theory, but really we're talking about the male stare, ultimately. That's what we're concerned, the aggressive, hungry, power-based look. But I think if we were, it, it, and I'm not saying men don't do both, but I think most of us stare mostly. We don't know how to gaze at each other, and it scares the shit out of people when you do it. Try it on the subway. It's fun. <laughs> you have to practice, because it's different. I mean, I could tell you, like, this is staring, right? I know so I can do this. This is gazing. <laughs> how was that for you, Tom? Here's the bottom line in terms of what we can do to solve this if we think we can or think we should. Um, he suggests basically three things, uh, which I am in full agreement with all three. One, a little much for us to go into too in depth, is, is to uh, embrace, I guess, embrace more Eastern philosophy. Uh, you know, Buddhism, blah, blah, blah. But most importantly in terms of all that, to embrace a circular multi-causal understanding of reality, right? Because the only way, the, the right hemisphere doesn't see causality, it just sees interconnectedness and relatedness. It's too much, right? So in the left hemisphere, we create this thing called linear causality, which we all believe in, but doesn't exist in the universe, yet we base everything on it, right? So the idea would be to start moving away from this notion of linear causality and embracing a more Eastern understanding of circularity. Right, of history as being cyclic rather than linear. Um, the other one is uh, uh, religion, you know, kind, uh, the kind obviously that I embrace more, the more open, metaphorical, blah, 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 not the, right? You know, we only get like terrorism when we get literalism. We have Buddhist terrorists thanks to literalism, right? Thanks to the left hemisphere, there are Buddhists who think Buddhism says you can kill people. I don't know if you know anything about Buddhism, but that doesn't make a lot of sense. So there's that problem. But otherwise, religion in general, this is always a hard sell, so I won't spend too much time on it because we're pretty anti-religion, which is another sign of the problem we're running into with left hemisphere dominance. But religion, that understanding of the world is very much more akin to the right hemisphere's understanding of the world. And the most important thing of all to me, because it's the easiest and it's already one I do a lot, is nature is re-engaging the natural world in a meaningful way. I don't mean going to nature zoos, which is what I call parks, though that's better than nothing, right? But just paying attention to the world, the aspects of the world that weren't built during the Industrial Revolution by the left hemisphere. And to, with that in mind, I was gonna ask them, I, I don't know if they have this book here, but I just read one of the most amazing books, and I'm probably gonna do a four-part olio on it, um, called How to Read Nature by, oh my God, I just looked up his name again. Nobody knows. I'll remind. Uh, Tristan Gooley. 
weird name. But it's stunning. He's a, a natural navigator, as he posits it. But it is a stunning book filled with these charming little exercises to help you re-engage the world around you. And even city people can do it. There's nature here. This room is filled with bugs. Little tiny bugs crawling all over the place. Sorry, Strand. I'm not saying you're not clean. <laughs> no, I'm just saying they're tiny, right? You are filled with bugs, right? Your eyebrows have little bugs that live in them. We all know about the gut now, right? We're covered with bugs. Other things live on us. So there is an argument that by body mass, we are more other things than the thing we call ourselves. So we either embrace all living things as part of what we are, or we have to get rid of half of ourselves. Oh, I guess on the internet, we won't have bugs. Oh, wait. <laughs> well, much worse bugs now that I think about it. Different kind. Anyway, that's the general idea is uh, we can find a way out of this. I think a lot of you already thought those three things I mentioned are useful and good to consider. But my argument and why I'm here tonight um, is I, I kind of jokingly call myself McGilchrist Bulldog, which is a reference to Darwin, but I want to spread this message. It may or may not be true. Um, all I know is I've spent 30 odd years studying philosophy, science, and religion, and only now do I feel like I've found something that at least offers a cohesive understanding. I don't know if he's right. I don't know. All I know is what he suggests is fruitful. And when I test it in my own life, and when I share it with people, they seem to agree. And if we could get, as I'm sure is his fantasy too, I'm too scared to contact him. I really should. <laughs> David almost did for me. I'm so shy. Michael keeps yelling at me. <laughs> anyway, um, but I think he has the same idea, which is that just sharing this way of thinking about how we operate in the world might actually make things better, might actually lead us to a place where we're not quite as brutal and hideous to each other all the time. That's my pitch. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Oh, my. Jesus. Yeah. Hello, what are the, oh, you're fine. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Ah, you picked someone. What? Do we have 10 minutes? Hi. Um, okay. Yes. So um, I, I, um, I understand and appreciate uh, some of the things that you're saying, but um, just I just think it's not that black and white. And um, I just to give you an example, because when you say uh, freedom and, and justice, and I think uh, a lot of time they're contradictory, and they're uh, they, they don't fit with each other. It's not compatible. Um, and and I, I'm taking this class on, on gender and domination, and uh, we're trying to uh, understand like sexuality um, and, and under the framework of um, anarchism and psychoanalysis, and. Um, and the, the, the thing comes up when we're trying to talk about rape and pornography, and then um, it, it, it seems like we're going into a direction where um, we're trying to explain the sexuality, um, the sexual violence under um, sexuality, which means that we're trying to, um, in a way, explain and understand the aggressor in rape, for example. And, 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 and so, I mean, so overall, I understand what you're saying about relating to each other and trying to connect with each other. Um, and to be more like understandable, and that's what we're trying to do. But but it's it is such like contradictory, because how I mean how can you reconcile with this kind of um, dilemma where where you're you know you're trying to enter? It's almost like we're we're trying to understand the, the aggressor in in such yeah, case. Yeah, why would isn't that the most important thing for us to do if we want to change their behavior? Um, well. So you're saying we're trying to understand them first, but, but, but... I think, not only do I think we need to understand them, I think we need to have compassion for them. I know that's a very hard sell, but until we have compassion to them, we treat them as other and further alienate them and make them further angry and disenfranchised, blah, blah, blah. I'm not saying it's okay for anyone to do what they do when it is so offensive, a behavior, but separating them, saying you're not one of us, is not gonna change the behavior. That would be my argument. Both as a therapist and as, well, whatever, the Gilchrist obsessive. Yeah, but like a after we understand them, still there is, we need restriction, right? Right, but first we got to try and understand them, right? I mean, sure. And maybe it's not, maybe the things that we would, maybe we would learn from them what it is they need from us so they can stop doing what they're doing. 
That's a more right hemisphere approach, right? So that's, I just, you know, I'll leave it at that, but that's, that would be a more right hemisphere understanding is that we need to first of all consider this another human being who is as worthy of love and care as any human being that's ever been born. I know that's a hard sell, but I don't see any way we can make progress as long as we say those people who do things we don't like aren't us. We're not saying that, but, but at the end of the day, it is, um, it is under the restriction, it's under the law, it's under the categorization that, that we try to Absolutely. understand. Absolutely. I, I mean, first of all, what you're pointing out is the paradox involved in trying to change the system from inside, and that's a problem. But I will just say, I mean, just my final thought on that is, is ultimately, I don't know, it's just so hard to pitch, and I, even as I say it, sometimes I feel awkward doing it. But until we have understanding and compassion for those we hate, we will never be able to do anything but hate them. But what about the victims? Yeah, them too. Everybody. Them too, like how, like, I mean. But they aren't more worthy, I don't know. I mean, I'm I feel gonna, like I, I because the whole conversation. So much trouble. No, I mean, the whole conversation, it turns out to be we're trying to understand the aggressor instead of trying to um, empath empathize with, aren't with they, the victims. I mean, I'm, this is, I seriously, this will be my, not to cut you off, but I want to give other people a chance. But aren't they the ones that are fucked up? Don't, aren't they the broken ones that we need to understand why they're broken so we can fix them so they stop screwing us over? And I mean that in all categories. Rapists, businessmen, insurance salesmen. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, you, got the mic. There, you have to fight for the mic, I think. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> just to take as a premise, which may not be appropriate, but we'll go with it, um, the practical syllogism. So Aristotle says, you know, we figure out goals or desires, and then we figure out a means to achieve that. So my question is about desire. Yeah. We have left and right brain. How, uh, could, could you elaborate on the complexity of how desire is formed, what we, what we want to achieve? Desire and is left in the hemisphere. And it's that fully? easy, yeah. Really? Yeah. So, wait, the right hemisphere has <laughs> no, Okay, well, that, that's, a, that's a simple answer. Okay. Well, no, it is a simple answer. And, and so, but I will give you a little, you know, uh, Longing, you know, McGill Chris makes this distinction very queer, clearly. <laughs> I, I, I do wonder about him, but, um, but um, desire is left hemisphere. It's similar to a stare. It's purposive. It's acquisitive. It's about control. It's about I know what I want out of the world. He pause, He contrasts that with longing in the right hemisphere, and longing he suggests is is wanting to be back with something you're already a part of. Right, something that's missing that you already know that you want to reconnect with. So that's longing. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't know. Um, Someone pass them. Oh, he right got here. the mic. Um, so a twofold question or two different questions. So I completely love your presentation and the agenda behind it, sort of. But I feel so. First question, though you do make the point several times that we need both. A, is there a chance of that you might be demonizing the left side a little no. too much? No. Um, <laughs> because you're, you're completely associating a lot of things. So to give you one example, you mentioned Ray Kurzweil, who yeah. one may agree or disagree with him, but the guy is, is partially motivated by a desire to bring his father back. That seems like a, that uh, sounds an very emotional left hemisphere, desire. hemisphere, though. The right hemisphere knows daddy's gone for good. The yeah, left hemisphere from thinks a, from care and, and desiring. Yes, that's, but that's reality, right? So I mean, it's a great question, but the right hemisphere is like, daddy's gone. That's how life works. Like one thing that's really worth noting is the general mood of the right hemisphere tends to be kind of melancholic, right? Sad, because the reality of life is sad. All life ends in death. Shit ain't fair. Like, life is, is uh, kind of Isn't melancholy. Isn't that dichotomous, though? I mean, there's also happiness and joy and humor. Absolutely, which is going to be more the left hemisphere in some ways. It's going to be the more positive one. The left hemisphere is kind of very positive and um, uh, hopeful. Not even hopeful. I would say hopeful is the right. But to, to your point, I mean, his desire for daddy to come back sounds like the left hemisphere to me because it's not realistic. Okay. It has nothing to do with reality. He's living in a fantasy world where instead of having to feel the pain of loss as a human being, he's going to break through that. He's going to solve all our problems and no one's ever going to have to feel pain again. That'd be nice. But kinda, second if you don't feel pain, what happens? You know what happens to people who don't feel? There are people that are incapable of feeling pain. They die very young because they get a little bruised and they die from it because they don't feel it. 
The second question is much simpler. Could it be that rather than, from my angle, demonizing the left side, you mentioned uh, the Industrial Revolution a lot of times. Can we just put it on capitalism, really? Because no, it's almost like you're demonizing is, science. I'd, I'd love to. I'm with you. Capitalism's a mess. But that is, to my mind, a layer over the Enlightenment and Industrial Revolution. Right? Those were things created by that left hemisphere mindset. So I've often asked myself, why the hell is it nobody has come up with a new system in hundreds of years? Oh, well, because the left hemisphere has been in charge. You've got to listen to the right hemisphere to come up with dogism or whatever. I like dogs. Whatever. Hi. Uh, thanks no again. I really love the presentation thus far. Um, I just wanted to throw out there, I don't know if you've uh, researched uh, affect regulation theory and how that would, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. would differ from like you know, lower, middle, and upper brains. Like maybe, a, a, I kind of like the idea of like a complex version of like there's left and right and lower, middle, upper. And that's in here and very yeah. much in the book as well. He's just focusing on this primary metaphor. But they're certainly acknowledged that there are different levels of organization besides yeah. right and left. Yeah. And in the book, you go, if you really want to do the neuroscience, even I glaze over a little in some of it, he does a lot of stuff about front and back, and so we simplify for right and left. I guess just to add to it, the, you know, there's sometimes I feel like the, from listening to you, there was like a difference between right and left when I was learning the affect regulation theory, and yeah. could be just language, I don't know. But you know, the right always seemed to be, you know, if your nervous system is activated and your amygdala is activated, you're feeling anger, it hits the memories in the right side of your brain, which is like implicit, and that's how you project. Like almost like the, the idea of like white matter in our brain right. probably happened because they, they recognized white was like this white stuff they saw before, so it automatically was just, we assume it was that. It's right. so the same idea when we date people and they remind us of so-and-so, like our parents, it's like that implicit projection on. Thing, so for the right-left hemisphere stuff, it's, sorry, for the right-left hemisphere yeah. stuff, it's really interesting. If you turn off someone's right hemisphere, they get face blindness. Mm -hmm. Their wife comes home from work and they don't recognize her because she bought a different shirt. Mm -hmm. Right? Think about that. The right hemisphere is what generates what we call the gestalt. Mm -hmm. The whole sense of a whole world existing. But literally, I mean, they can do this. You turn off the right hemisphere and you don't recognize faces anymore. Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah, I think just my final point. And uh, the amygdala plays into that as well. Yeah, it's just that with, I've worked with a lot of trauma victims and a big part of it is sort of the implicit memory or experiences they had. You have to like relax the body so that the information can cross over to the left side of the brain, rewrite the narrative to right. it, and then bring it back to the implicit knowledge. Yes. And that cycle is so important. It is vital, right? Thank you, because that's one of the most important things to point out, is that the bottom line is there's supposed to be a constant communication. Stuff comes in from the world to the right, goes to the left to get kind of unpacked and explored, and then goes back to the right to be checked against reality again. That's the part I feel like we're skipping a lot of the time. Yes. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> just want to say thank you because it was excellent. Um, the, uh, the question that I had was uh, you mentioned that McGillchrist had written sort of a history of the world with having, wow. of the West having laid out all of this information about the left and the right hemisphere. Um, I wanted to know about what he might have written about the transitions from the left and the right hemisphere changing uh, in their dominance yeah. culturally. And, and you had also mentioned, like, if we go far enough to the left hemisphere and make enough categories, right. we'll come full circle. Well, and that I mean seems that, to be yeah. <laughs> maybe where we're going with, with things right now. And I want to know if there was a precedent for that. I don't know if he would agree with that, but what he shows historically, just briefly, um, this is, again, an so much in this book, we could spend months together, but um, what he argues is in both cases, whether it's a shift from left to right, or and it's never all right. We would be dead if we were pure right hemisphere. We need to grasp and manipulate the world. We need to make distinction between rocks and bread, right? With no left hemisphere, we would do, we're like a kid just eating whatever's in front of us. <laughs> so we need both, again, but what happens, he argues, in all the cases, whether it's switching more to balanced or switching more to left, is a sense of inauthenticity. And this should hit home, right? This is the thing, is that when we go too far into the left hemisphere's world, experience, perspective, the world starts to seem unreal. We lose a sense of being authentic ourselves or experiencing the world itself authentically, and that makes us yearn for some of the things of the right hemisphere, like nature, right? There's a reason we all try and get away when we're away from work, whatever. Like religion, as people often strive when their lives are feeling empty 
to connect with religion. I don't know if it, well, Buddhism. A lot of people turn to Buddhism in a similar manner. Similarly, if you're too far into the right hemisphere, apologies, you're a hippie, and life feels inauthentic because you just smell and experience it all the time and not actually engaging in it all. Right? But I mean, just to make the point, I'm perfectly fine with hippies or whatever, but the, the idea being is too far into the right hemisphere of the world becomes inauthentic because we're not meaningfully engaging it. Too far into the left hemisphere of the world becomes inauthentic because we're not actually experiencing the world itself, just a picture in our head. Great question. I think maybe they'll come out. Um, are there um, sort of uh, ripe? All right, fine. I'll get to the left side of the room. You're right. I'm being so clear. <laughs> nice. Um, um, are, are there phen phenomena that would appear to be right brain or left brain at an individual level, say, that become sort of the opposite side of the brain on a group level? So, I don't know. Um, so let's say the idea that the philosophy of a trade-off, you know, trade a trade-off. When he said, for example, the white brain says that's life, right? And you know, sort of, I, I think a trade-off would have sort of a similar sort of thinking around it. I um, do understand your question, and the bottom line, at least you know, from the culture's perspective, and I seem to see the same thing. Is no, when you have a very left hemisphere culture, you tend to have very left hemisphere people. I mean, there are always breakouts, right? There's always variety. But can we go over there? Because we're yelling again. We're only being on this. Ten minutes? All right. So, there we go. Guys, just like class, I got distracted and can't remember what you were saying. Um, it, it's, you know, there will be, right, there's always going to be more variability in individual populations than we expect. So, there will be. I mean, obviously, McGill Chris came out of a left hemisphere civilization. So, there are still people that, that do it, but it seems to be. Is that your question? Sort of. Um, so, well, when I'm thinking of a trade off with an individual, right. I'm thinking more or less of a loss of control. Uh, because I can't have everything I want. Right. Which the idea that you want everything you want is already into the left hemisphere realm, right? Does that make sense? Right? It's, it's, that's the desire question, which I thought was really important, right? Then we start drifting back. As soon as you see yourself thinking, I can be in charge of this, we know we're in left hemisphere. And that's fine if it's connected to knowledge from the right hemisphere. Because if you say, I can be, I don't know, sometimes you win. Like Trump, you know, you, I'm sure you had lots of voices saying, actually, probably didn't have voices saying you can't be president. But the thing, I mean, you can push and push and push and keep going with the left hemisphere and get lucky sometimes. Um, but there's always, it's always going to pull you back a bit. I got lost there, yeah. <laughs> uh, hi, yeah, uh, thanks for the really great talk, first of all. I uh, really appreciated it. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about a, uh, a different left and a different uh, double-barreled name here. Uh, uh, Horkheimer and Adorno, uh, in their book, The Dialectic of Enlightenment, sounds a lot like what you're saying, but they're a bit more pessimistic about... Uh, uh, you know, yeah. sort of the trans, the tra uh, possible transition back. They're right. they're they're pretty much, we're fucked. So I w would <laughs> was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that sort of side of it, the sort of the future look forward looking. I don't know. I mean, it's funny because if you're going to start bringing up other philosophers, I'm more interested in Zizek, who wanted Trump to be president because it would create chaos. Well, I think he was just on too much coke. So right. But it, uh, what's that? Oh, Zizek was just on too much coke when he said that. Well, maybe it's entirely possible. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's going to be one of the things too, you know, this entire book is not all McGill, Chris ideas. It's filled with philosophers. He does a lot of stuff on um, phenomenology, right? So it's all really kind of grounded in certain schools of philosophy that have understood. You know, what he points out, philosophy is basically pure left hemisphere trying to describe the right hemisphere's experience. So certainly what a lot of these folks are doing. Somebody over here, did you want one? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Trouble. You're just I gonna need yell. the technology. We need it for the technology. Oh, we need it for the recording, for posterity. Yeah, you, All right, so, um, you accept your death and So impertinence. one comment, one question. The comment is like, isn't it true, it, uh, check, just like, tell me if I'm wrong here, but it really seems like science 
what we call science is hogging way too much credit here for technicolog technological information uh, and advances because last time I checked, the scientific method, the first step is hypothesis, which is an idea, right? So the left brain is testing ideas coming in, and correct me if I'm wrong, but from the right brain, mm -hmm. the observation of nature. Right, so what we call science is a testing of an idea. And, and you know, you point out something really important, which is to remember where what we call science. First of all, let's all admit our pompous, arrogant Western attitude here, because we call science the kind of science we invented. As if all those primitive people before the Enlightenment never did anything scientific or rational, they were just a bunch of idiots. It's also the problem with progressivism, right? The assumption is we are the best humans have ever been, so our grandparents are stupid assholes. <laughs> That's the argument, if humans keep improving. So then we go back to science, and the kind of science we specifically address is reductionistic, materialistic methodology. There are other ways of doing science. I like, one of my favorite is uh, the anarchist epistemology that a guy from Berkeley suggested in the 60s, which is he basically, he said kind of jokingly, anything goes. Anything that can help us understand the world better counts as scientific information. One of my favorite quotes I've ever heard is a, uh, was an, uh, he was like a biologist, studied animals, I can't remember, but I heard him on something and he said, the plural of anecdote is data. Right, and we like to deride anecdotes as useless, but anecdote is storytelling. That's the right hemisphere's realm. But we say anecdote doesn't count as scientific information, it's just what somebody thinks. But if you have 5,000 people thinking the same thing, that's data. Um, and the last thing, the main thing to your point, it made me think of a ton of things, you always do. Um, Science started, at, the science as we know it, Western science started as natural theology, which was men mostly, almost pretty much exclusively, of the church studying nature to better understand God. And that's I think exactly what Michael's talking about is we lost the idea that we, science is the mission of studying nature to better understand reality. Now science's primary mission is help everybody make more money. Yes. Okay, so the question is, um, and you kind of opened the door, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask, where would you locate what we call ego? Is, are you saying that ego has its seat? He knows I've been working on this. Here's where I put ego without giving you all a whole lecture on Freud, but whatever, and just in case, it is arguably our kind of primal urges, desires, and needs. Uh, Superego is what has been inculcated in us by society, by our family, the rules and restrictions. So superego is supposed to kind of keep it under control, but without any id, we lose authenticity. I mean, we, again, without id, we're lifeless. Um, id gets a bad rap, but it, it, is, it is vital. Um, it's not just for sex and violence, it's for getting out of bed, right? Like to get up in the morning and make it here tonight, that required id. Um, if you beat a lot of people up on the way, that's too much it, right? So ego in Freud's schema is the only conscious part of our personality, and it is the part whose job is, as it develops through life, to moderate between the ego and the, the id and superego, right? So in that case, ego for me in this schema is basically the same thing. And I've been working on this because I'm pretty confident now in saying, he never does, if I ever go to the Isle of Skye and have oysters with him, I'll see, but he never says this, but I am pretty confident in making the assertion that id is right hemisphere and superego is left. And it makes a lot of sense if you study this stuff, right? That the, those primal forces that we're scared of are coming out of here. The left is like, no, shut up, be a good citizen, right? That's kind of the schema. Great question, thank you. Yeah, uh, one more? I don't know what's going on. Time. Uh, it was good. Um, so I have a question about like um, some of the, so, um, uh, so let's say that I'm going to refer to Descartes because, you know, because some people would be throwing some philosophers out there. So right, yeah, I know. I'm going to just throw one because I want to keep this going. <laughs> so um, Descartes, when we was going to like the discourse of metaphysics, 
was um referred to um you know just not like assuming anything because um you know so assuming anything I'm I'm referring to like referring to the right um right hemisphere of your brain thing and um you're just trying to prove that something is just just pure purely you know you're, so. you're speaking of Descartes yeah yeah it's it, Descartes I mean that's a great thing to bring up and like a whole nother oleo maybe a series those who know me know I don't know I still considering my primary mortal enemy um <laughs> I'd rather bring him back than Kurzweil's dad so I could kill him again um <laughs> sorry just don't like that dude but I mean he you know he can be interpreted in certain ways that are more open but I put a lot of this at his feet because the idea, you know, one of the most famous things is him sitting in his room, looking out at the street and seeing people walk by and saying to himself and then writing to us, why shouldn't I just imagine these all as automatons? And here we are, close to a point where we basically think we're all machines. The machine model gets applied to everything, and it was in large part Descartes that introduced us to that concept. Whether that was ultimately what he's saying, because I've gotten into a lot of arguments with fans of Descartes, I don't care what he was really saying, this is what we got. This is what came down from him. But yeah, I mean, he's an interesting dilemma, and he certainly, he really pushes this question. Last question. Last one. Sorry. Oops, sorry. Go quick while he's getting the mic. That, a great question is how do we talk to each other? Well, I guess, first of all, try and find balanced people to be with and we'll form a group and start the revolution. No, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but how do you do it? Uh, you know, I'm back to the same thing because it even goes to, to her earlier question about what do we do with um, perpetrators, that's the word, um, people who are messing everything up for us. Um, I'm going to say the same thing. It's just compassion. You know, I, I encounter quote unquote very left hemisphere people all the time and there's two reactions I have. This one's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> and the other is like, they're a human being too. And, and you know what, if I actually treat them the way I would treat anyone, right? Not try and drop to their left hemisphere level, if you will, but if I really just kind of try and engage them in a meaningful way as a human being, then you will see the right hemisphere come out. It wants out. It really wants out, it's just the left hemisphere is more powerful and has more support in our society. Not that I hate it, it just has, it's more powerful and has more support. So we want to hear the voice of the right hemisphere. So I, I really do think it's just about trying to be as compassionate and, and real with each other. On the other hand, there's some people that are so far left, you just gotta walk away, right? I mean, we all know those people, you're not having a conversation. I used to joke they were people who got sent from Mars to check out Earth, but they missed the final lesson back on Mars that would have made them convincing humans? <laughs> Last question, I guess. So uh, d does it make you feel uh, funny that, that, the, that the reconciliation between left and right is left to the responsibility of the left? Like to actually have metacognition that, that reconciles the two, the left is the only one that's, possible, that's actually capable of doing so? Honestly, with this understanding, it, it makes me hopeful because the left is the only thing I can do anything about. Right, so, and, and what does one do? Again, this, this Tristan Gooley book, you know, cheesy I know, but meditation, mindfulness. Mindfulness is my bigger push. Meditation's a harder sell, but mindfulness is easy. You're sitting on the train and you're in your head. You're in your left, when you're in your head having discussions with yourself, that's not schizophrenia, it's the left hemisphere. Well, and some of it's coming, it will actually, uh, schizophrenia is pretty definitively understood now as the opposite it used to be, which is hyper-rationality, not a lack of rationality. Schizophrenics hear voices in their head like all of us, but they don't understand it's their own head making them. We all know that's our own head. But when you're in there caught up in that thing, this is what I do to stay sane, is I'm sitting, I don't use any electronics in the subway, I don't wear headphones. I wanna be engaged in the world because that's how I feed my right hemisphere. So when I'm in the train and it gets boring, I look around. I notice how weird it is that there's 16 different kinds of screws in every MTA card. How many people know that? <laughs> 
Not saying it's useful information, but it keeps me connected with the reality in my immediate vicinity. And I will suggest this, I, I gather we need to wind up, so I will suggest this as, as a kind of final thought really, which is we think the subways are so boring, and I actually have been lately obsessed with why human beings love zooming around in tin cans of all sorts. So we, I just had a week off for spring break and I was like, I don't have to go in a tin can. A car, a subway, a plane, we love being in tin cans. Um, but when we're in those tin cans, we tend to think of it as boring because all we're is surrounded by a bunch of strangers. I don't remember who had said it, but uh, there's so many lovely quotes in the Miguel Chris book, but he quotes somebody as saying that the human face is the most interesting surface on the planet. So learn to see each other and appreciate each other's faces. I know it can get weird, but trust me, I've been in New York a long time. We used to talk to each other on the subway. I have friends who met their life partners on the subway, not on Tinder while they were on the subway, <laughs> actually on the subway. So I would suggest generally, to, I mean, this addresses your question too, engage people. Don't stare at them. Gaze at them. Notice how interesting our faces are. That's a great place to start. Because you know what loves faces? The right hemisphere. Thank you all very much. I really hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>